testing. Okay, perfect. Testing one, two. That's so much louder. Yeah, because it's on, right? Okay, good. This evening I want to speak to you on a very important subject. Purity, or in other words, keep thyself pure. If you've made a decision to keep yourself pure, then go ahead, make it again, reaffirm your decision, because the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you've never made the decision that I'm encouraging tonight, make the decision to keep yourself pure. Pure. A lot of times people look at fundamental Bible-believing preachers as the ones that are just ranting and raving, trying to make a point, trying to make sure that you're not happy in life. We meet together on conferences like this uh, a week before you get together, and the youth pastors and the pastors and the visiting speaker, and we say, what are the kids like? And we say, okay, if they like that, then let's tell them they can't do it because we don't want them to have fun. That's our goal. We're going to give an invitation tonight and ask you to come forward if you'll abdicate fun for the rest of your life, okay? That's not what we do. Matter of fact, contraire, we do the opposite of that. What we're pushing for tonight can actually increase the joy of your life. Big time. And again, it's not just an opinion that I have as an adult, Bible-believing person, but even people that are not known as Bible-believing preachers would agree with it. Now, Bible-believing pre pre preachers and people do believe it, such as Paige Patterson, who for several years, he and his wife, counseled 2,000 young people, 1,000 couples before they got married. And here's what Dr. Patterson and his wife discovered. And that is that every young couple, <clears throat> every young person of the 2,000 that they counseled that were sexually promiscuous before marriage, every one of them had problems sexually after marriage. But they found out that those that kept themselves pure for marriage, that is, not having any kind of activity with any other young person or even each other, even each other, because even if you do it, do marry that person, you're bringing some, some stuff into the marriage that doesn't need to be there. But he said those couples never counsel them about problems sexually after marriage. But see, isn't that contrary to what the world would say? The world would say experiment with this thing. I always ask this question before I marry anybody. Are you living together? Used to, the faces would blush and they would say, well, of course not, Pastor. I said, well, I know there's just a group of questions I have to ask. Nowadays, I ask that question to people that are not faithfully attending our church, and I'll have them look at each other, not blush, and say, well, yes, we are. Is there a problem with that? Uh, parenthetically, by the way, I do have a problem with that. I say, you know, you're not going to be living together in sin and then walk down an aisle in white in this church. I said, I'm not saying I'm going to marry you, but not yet. Somebody's got to move out. And we've got to go through a couple or three months of, 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 a, uh, of some purity that maybe you haven't enjoyed for a long time, but we're going to go through this if you want to be married in this church. But it is an amazing, very sad thing when I'm hearing people, young people, young people, just think that it's perfectly all right to have sexual relations before marriage. As though living together and trying out will improve your marriage after you get married. By the way, statistically, they're proving that it does the opposite. It, if you want to spend your life with a person for the rest of your life, that's one surefire way of making sure that it won't happen. Yeah. Dr. Stephen Dirks, who for all practical purposes was the one most singular man that brought us into the computer age. I mean, everything has changed, especially since the Gemini and the Apollo and the uh, Mercury space shots. You know that we went to the moon and back with Commodore technology? In other words, there is right now more sophisticated computer work in the dashboard of a Ford Taurus than the entire space mission that got the Apollo rocket to the moon and back. That's how everything changed. But it wasn't Stephen Jobs of Apple or William Gates of MSN uh, that, um, or Microsoft that, that brought us into this place or Intel. Those guys took advantage of what had already been invented, but Stephen Dirks is one of the first inventors, has over 30 patents with IBM, one of the first inventors of the computer, the chips, etc., as we know now. Garbage in, garbage out. The early days of computer, they figured it out. They asked Stephen Dirks, Josh McDowell asked Dirks in his book, Give or Takers and Other Kind of Lovers, 
how did you make the computer? He said, basically, we modeled it off the human mind. If you want some computer to measure heartbeats, then you measure it and program it for that. If you want it to measure the speed of an object, you, you, you program it for that. If you want to you know, program it for mathematics, or if you want to program it for word processing, you program it for that. Then they begin to talk about the human mind and human sexuality. And Dr. Stephen Dirks, who has, takes an IQ of 140 to be considered a genius, his IQ goes up over 200 and it's become immeasurable. He, he literally is off the charts. So it isn't a dummy. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the human mind. But here's what Stephen Dirks of Stanford University, inventor of the computer, said about human sexuality. He said, when a girl is intimate, doesn't even have to go to the limit, but is intimate with, let's say, 22 different young men, she has a, com she has a complicated sexual programming that's taken place. So that when she marries the guy that she's supposed to be married to for the rest of her life, he doesn't quite compute. If I can add one other thing, when a young man exposes his mind to pornography and other things, and right now there's 84 million bottom figure, 84 million pornographic websites available for Americans. That's why some of you need to consider very strongly having someone observe your history and put safeguards and checks on your computers or on your phones. And I'm going to say something parenthetical that some of you kids might should really consider. If some of you have already gone there and you've developed a palate and a taste for pornography, it may do you well to give up iPhones, Samsungs, or any smartphones and have just a, I'm not believing I'm about to say what I'm about to say, have an old-fashioned cell phone. Let me tell you something. When my old-fashioned was old-fashioned, there were no cell phones. I remember when the little beepers on the belt were big. If I wanted to call my wife from the downtown hospital and tell her what time I'm coming, I had to pull over and use a phone booth. That's where I changed into that outfit. Okay? <laughs> So, 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 so you might consider not having one of these smartphones that can pull up pictures and stuff. I'm serious. Something you can text mom and dad, you can call somebody, but you can't go into the internet world, okay? Whatever you need to do. Or consider this, make a commitment to the Lord and, and only do the computer work in the presence of your parents or somebody else in the room so that at any given time they can look over and see exactly what's on your screen. Don't ever take it for granted that you're strong enough to withstand the amount of temptation that comes your way. You've got to really become strong. And you know, and God has not designed us to become strong by ourselves. That's why we're the body of Christ. And, the, and God compared us to eyes and ears, limbs. But we need each other. If, and if you're missing a leg, you're not going to run any marathon without a prosthesis, without some help, right? Uh, it'd be nice to have a leg. So here's what I, you need help. Get it. But Dirk said, and, and going back to the guys, you, you put 350 different dirty pictures in your mind. You get married to the girl you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with. And guess what? When, when you're together as husband and wife, it doesn't compute. Stephen Dirks said the happiest marriages are not those that experiment sexually before marriage, but the best marriages. This is Stanford University, Stephen Dirks from California, not, not a born-again, Bible-believing, Bible-thumping preacher. He said, the happiest marriages are when you keep your hands off each other, stay pure, and get married, watch this, then program each other to one another. So that he, ladies, is always your knight in shining armor, and she is forever your only fantasy. There is no frame of reference to compare them by. Yeah. Young people, it is incredibly dangerous to go into the sensual world of sexuality. Now, mind you, it is normal and it is right that you have a desire that is developed for the opposite sex. 
But because I have a desire, are you listening? Because I have a desire to eat 15 biscuits for breakfast and a pound of bacon and four, or rather a dozen eggs every morning, does that mean I should feed that desire simply because I have the desire? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Young people, listen to me. The Bible says this in verse number in verse number three. For this, uh, uh, First Thessalonians four. I'm sorry. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. There's only two places in the entire Bible that you will find that phrase. For this is the will of God. Interesting enough, the only other place is if you turn the page, First Thessalonians five eighteen. In everything, give things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we can say it is the will of God for you to be happy and thankful. But before God wants you to be happy, he says, this is the will of God that you be holy. He gets specific. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. The word there is pornea. By the way, porneographia, that's the word we get pornography from. This is sexual uncleanness. Abstain from fornication. That means sexual activity of any kind. The Bible gives us a command. Brother Johnny Crane, that is not a suggestion. He says, this is the will of God that you should abstain from fornication. He did not say it would be best. He did not say, if you can, by the way, you can do all things through Christ. He says, this is the will of God. He says in verse 7, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He said in 1 Timothy 5, you read it a while ago, keep thyself pure. Pastoring the same church for 33 and a half years, preaching for 44 years, I have talked to more than one young person that has come into my office that has defiled themselves sexually. Always, it's with tears. And I've never yet, ever, ever had a young person come into my office and say, but the Pope, I have done thus and so, but you know, I planned to do that all along. They never say that. They almost always open up with this tear-filled statement, Brother Pope, I never planned to do this. And you know what? They're telling me the truth. They're not lying. They didn't plan to do this. But I'm going to talk to you about how we can plan not to do it. There's an old saying, if you plan to fail, I already jumped the gun on that one. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Let's talk about this because I think if I were to ask every one of you right now, do you plan to become sexually involved or those of you that have made a tragic mistake, do you plan to do it again? I think every young person here, I really believe this brother Crane, would raise a hand and say, I do not plan to do that ever again. Can you help me? And the word of God can help you. I cannot, but the word of God can. How can I? Number one, accept the command for purity as emphatic. Don't allow yourself wiggle room here. Don't allow yourself to think that it's ever going to be okay. Can I show you how important it is to emphatically obey that command? The Bible says this, and this is so good to remember. In Psalm, it says, in thy light shall we see light. I believe that's Psalm 36.9. Would you double check that for me, Brother Johnny? Psalm 36.9. In thy light shall we see light. The rest of you do me a favor and turn to Mark chapter 4. I wasn't going to give that passage, but I want to share something with you because a lot of times young people don't realize how important it is to obey what God has given you. Did you find Psalm 36.9? Is that the verse? In thy light shall we see light. Make note of that and memorize it. In thy light shall we see light. What that means is, watch this. If we obey the light that God gives us, he will give us more light in the future. Does that make sense? Can we also say if I ignore the light that God gives me, then that I'll be walking in darkness rather than light? I want to tell you something. I have really hurt myself by trying to walk across motel rooms I was not familiar with. 
One of my goals when I wake up in the middle of the night, which is not unusual, is if I go to the restroom, if I go get something like this morning, I got up early in the morning because I needed to get some things done for Sunday and I wanted to get my laptop that was over here and I needed to get my Bible that was over here. So it, it, and more than once I, I thought to myself, I'm not going to wake up Barbara, so I won't turn on the light. Do you understand that turning the light has life, like, a lot less likely, lot likelihood of waking her up than when I knock the entire suitcase over on top of her? <laughs> so in my stupidity of, of believing that I could navigate a dark room that I'm not familiar with, I actually go into more trouble. But I have found an oh, what man doesn't love a good flashlight? Do I have an amen right there? I just love it. This past Father's Day, we gave every father a little flashlight, and you'd think that we had given them a diamond ring. Yeah. By the way, I have mine with me, and I've used it three times today already. I just love it. My wife says sometimes, why don't you turn on the light? I said, because I got it in my hand, because I got this neat flashlight. I'm not knocking things over when I got the light on. Did you hear it? Listen to what I'm saying. If you ignore what you know the Bible has told you to do, it is presumptuous to think God's going to give you further instructions. I want to say it again. If you ignore what God has plainly told you to do, you are being presumptuous to believe God is going to give you further instruction. He will not. Psalm 66, 18 tells us that. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? He will not hear me. You know what that means in the Hebrew? He won't hear you. You know the deep theological underlying message there? He won't hear you. Talk to the nails pierced hand. He's not talking to you. In, Ma in Mark chapter 4, that along that same principle, I want you to see this. Verse 23, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. God says that no less than 15 times in the New Testament. He that hath ears, let him hear. You ever had your mother say, I want you to do such and such? And you said, why? Mom says, well, wait a minute. What do you mean why? I told you an hour ago. I didn't hear you. You ever said that to your mother? I didn't hear you. But you got ears. You're hearing everything she's saying right now. Why didn't you hear an hour ago? Because you didn't have ears to hear. You, you were listening to the sounds of uh, Mario. You listen to the sounds of your own weird mind thinking, maybe. I don't know. But I'm telling you, it is a weird thing. And as a husband who's got his wife here right now, I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't hear everything she says. It's not because I'm going hard of hearing. I am enjoying 63 right now because I don't think I do hear as well, so it has worked for me. But anyway, um, but then I'm guilty of deceitfulness if I do that, okay? If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Then it says in verse 24, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Let me slow down and talk about that. Jesus said unto you that hear shall more be given. If I don't hear what he told me here, he's not going to give me more information here. If I ignore what God said about keeping myself pure and abstaining from sexual activity, I have no right to say, God, reveal your will to me. Do you want me to preach? Do you want me to be a lawyer? Want me to be a doctor? Want me to be in real estate? Want me in garbage collection? Whatever you want me to be in. By the way, success is finding the will of God for your life and doing it, but you're not going to know the will of God if you ignore what you know is right. Billy Sunday said, it's not what I don't understand in the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do understand the Bible and don't do anything about. Raise your hand. Does anybody have any problem understanding keep thyself pure. Anybody got a problem with that? Raise your hand and I will come tutor you right now. Did you understand it? If you understood it, give me a good hand raise on that. You understand it? Keep it up. Then don't expect God to give you any more information if you ignore that plain command. You can put your hands down, sit up straight, keep listening. Okay? You want, hey, 
I was touched because I saw adults really sit up on that. Thank you. Thank you, adults. That kind of touched my heart a little bit there. Number one, accept the command for purity as emphatic. No wiggle room. Number two, how can I keep myself pure? Look at Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 for just a moment. Proverbs chapter 6. Preacher Crane, did I take any scripture out of context so far? Am I okay? In that Bible? It's as Bible as John 3.16. I'm telling young people, you don't realize how important it is to obey the light that God's given you so he can give you more light. To hear what he's telling you so that he will give more information to you. Because I want you to be in God's will for the rest of your life. Proverbs 6 and verse number 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. <laughs> I guess God's serious about you listening to what your parents tell you. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, I like that, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, unto the, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now remember the context of our scripture. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. See, Jesus promised John 10.10 10, that we'd have life and have it more abundantly. He says in verse 24, To keep thee from the evil woman, wow, from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Wow. By the way, Here's something that I don't say too often to a crowd full of adults that have gone there and done this. But every now and then, and I feel like doing it here. If you develop an appetite for sexual activity promiscuously, do not think that marriage is a silver bullet that will cure your runaway lust. Let me say that again. If you are doing sexual things before marriage, illicitly, promiscuously, do not think that marriage is a silver bullet that takes care of that runaway passion. You're setting yourself up to be an adulterer in the future. An adulterer is a person who fornicates after they've made a vow of marriage. It's pretty serious stuff. In the Old Testament, you got stoned to death for it. You want to see something? Years and years ago, I heard Cecil Hodges discuss this, and I've never forgotten. Remember Cecil Hodges? Boy, I miss some of those old preachers. But they, they were not embarrassed to lay it down on the line. But he's the one that brought this to my attention. Verse 32. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. <laughs> Let me give you a good uh, 21st century phrase. Whoso committeth adultery with a woman is three fries short of a happy meal. Both oars aren't in the water. You are not thinking. You've left your brain outside on the curb. He that doeth it, look at this, destroyeth his own soul. That's the personality that you have. It warps and affects your very personality. Now here's the sad thing that maybe some of you have never thought about. A wound and dishonor shall he get. And his reproach shall not be wiped away. The word of God is saying you will never get over the ramifications and the results or the consequences of what you're doing. You see, it's illustrated in the Bible. David was forgiven for his adultery, Psalm 51. But he never got over the effects. Matter of fact, he said, whoever did this will pay back fourfold. That has killed a little lamb, a little ewe lamb. And Nathan said, thou art the man. Without going into another whole sermon, do you realize that David had four kids that died? He said, he will pay back fourfold. Let me tell you something, young people. You better let God 
help you get this thing under control because if you keep going this direction, you're setting yourself up not only for further fornication and immoral action and guilty consciousness, but a life that will bring in adultery after you're married. Well, what is the point? The point is, on this point, is my son keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Number two, you want to keep yourself pure. Acknowledge parental rights. And parents have the right to say, you've been with that guy, you've been with that girl too much, cool it. Your parents have the right to say that. Let them guide you. Let them coach you. Let them help you. They're your parents. Matter of fact, I feel led of the Lord to tell you another uh, story that I don't tell very often. I just feel at home here today. My children were going to Christian school until about junior high school and the one they were going to closed down and, and we were having a difficult time knowing exactly what God's will was and Ma, Barbara and I prayed and sought God's face and they went to public school one of the largest public schools in America I do and I'm very thankful that we were given a lot of respect about the way that we reared our kids and if we didn't want them to read the, a certain book they, they were very good to us we had a dress code uh, one of my daughters marched in the band she was the only girl in the band that had culottes 300 <laughs> band members and you had one I remember being up in the, uh, the, the, the what, bleachers and say, is that girl out there in a skirt? <laughs> but anyway, it was cool. Us. But anyway, um, but I appreciate the respect they gave us. I, I, I will say this now, if I had children school age now, I, I would either have them in a good Christian school somewhere else or homeschool them. That's what I would do now, okay? So I just want to clarify that because this is going to help you understand the story better. Our kids are all musicians, our son was competing in the state championships. Um, I, I don't know that they called them championships, but number one band, number one orchestra in the state of Texas. Matter of fact, we were with him when their, when their uh, orchestra that he played in was the number one of the eight number one orchestras in the state of Texas, and they played in Carnegie Hall on the, eighth, um, um, on the 100th anniversary of Carnegie Hall in New York City. Matter of fact, the hotel we stayed in was destroyed on 9-11. Um, that has nothing to do with the illustration. But Jonathan's room had already been paid for. We'd already paid for his room. And I'd already talked to my friends down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And they were going to pick up Jonathan for church on Sunday. And the night before he was to go, he had his duffel bag packed and everything. God spoke to my heart. He's not to go. Don't let him go. I mean, I saw the Lord's face, and I mean, God spoke to my heart. I had no reason. And at this time, Jonathan was kicking the traces just a little bit, okay? So on the way to school that morning, with his bags packed, room reserved, everything paid for, cello, statewide competition for the orchestras, I announced to him, your bag's staying in the car, son. I'll be here at 3 o'clock to pick you up. You're not going to Corpus. God spoke to my heart. If you're going to ask me why, I don't have a good explanation other than you're going to have to trust me that I've had communication with God last night and this morning. He confirmed it. You're not going, and that's it. I was ready. I was ready to pull off the road if he smarted off to me. I mean, I was ready. We, I was going off the road. I told him that. Silence. I had to look to make sure he had not jumped out of the car. <laughs> he was looking at me. I remember I looked over and he was looking at me like this. So I was waiting for him to smart off. I was prepared. I had the whole armor of God on. I was ready. <laughs> but he didn't have any armor on his behind and I was ready. He said, Brother Pope in high school? Yes, spare the rod, spoil the child. Don't look at me like that. I was ready. I'm not going to take anything off it. I knew I heard from God. He said, Dad, you really did hear from God, didn't you? And I thought, is that Jonathan? I said, well, yes, son, I, I really did. And at that time, Jonathan had walked down the aisle like I'm going to ask y'all to do in just a little bit and make a vow of purity and here's what he said to me he said I know you heard from God dad he 
said, Dad, now this is a 5A public school, Houston, Texas. He said, Dad, this cheerleader, I think she was the captain of the cheerleaders, they're going down to Corpus. And several of my friends have come up to me and said, her goal is that Jonathan Pope will not come back to Houston as a virgin. I said, Dad, she's hot. Dad, I don't plan to do it, didn't plan to do it, but I need some help, Dad. I'll be happy to tell my friends, my dad had other plans for me and I can't come. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Jonathan got out of the car and I said, Oh, God, thank you! I had, listen, I had, God didn't give me details, but I'm his father and God tipped me off. I remember my wife and I were sitting in our in our house. Uh, uh, we had dropped Juliana off at one place, and uh, the kids had very strict rules about where they would go, where they would not go. And there was a guy that she was not going to supposed to be dating at all. And all of a sudden, Barbara said, "Where's Juliana?" I said, "Well, she's." So we called, and they said she wasn't there. And boy, like that, Barbara said, "Call this boy." And I said, "She doesn't even know that guy." Call that boy. We called that house and said, is Juliana there? Got on the phone. Juliana? Dad? How'd you know I was here? (laughs) Because God told Mother, you're in trouble. Man, we got Juliana. She, she, She was the most quiet I've ever heard her. Moms and dads are not perfect, but if they know Jesus Christ, one of the best gifts you can have is a mom and dad to help you stay pure. But why are you making me break up? Because we're good Christians and everything. I have pastored good Christians that have done things they shouldn't have done. Number one, accept the command from God as a... For purity as emphatic. Number two, acknowledge parental rights. Number three, acquire righteous friendships. First Timothy 5.22 says, Lay hands suddenly on no man. Then it said, Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. In the context of the scripture, here's what it says, Brother Carr. Don't hang out with the wrong friends. Keep yourself pure. Meaning, if you hang out with the wrong friends, it's going to be very difficult to keep yourself pure. That's what I would call a duh moment. Get it? Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Why does he say neither be partaker of other men's sins? Because if you hang around somebody, you often behave like that somebody. I, I'm going to illustrate something. If you could put that Bible down, Brother Crane, I'm going to get you to help me. I am serious. Now, now, I'd like for you to stand down there, okay? I am serious, Brother Crane. Now, you're going to face me. You're going to stand down there. I, I'm serious, okay? I don't you do, With your permission, Dad, I would like for him not to be overly respectful for, to me at this moment. Is that okay? I'm going to ask you. He has to think about this. Um, okay, I'm gonna. Okay, I'll put it to you like this. I'm gonna ask you. Here's the command. I'm gonna not the command. Here's the request. I'm gonna say. I want you. I'm gonna try to stay on the second step, and I'm gonna ask you to pull me off the second step. And I really want you to do it. Is it okay if he does that? Hey, it's not gonna hurt me. Okay, it's not gonna, this guy can't hurt me. <laughs> but I tell you what, I am gonna try to do. And do, you're not gonna hurt my watch either. Okay. Okay. No, no, you're not gonna hurt that. I'm going to let you grab my wrist, grab that one right there uh, with that hand, okay? And then I'm going to grab this one. And I'm, I'm serious. Don't, don't cut me any slack. I'm going to try to stay on the second step. Okay. Now go. Now go. Okay. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm getting old. 
Brother, Brother Crane, now help me out. Tell me the honest God's truth. Which was harder? Picking you up. <laughs> you want to think about that? Uh, let, let me ask you this. Don't lie. Was it a lot harder? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That's enough. All right. You know what I have people tell me often? Are you listening? You know what I have kids tell me? Oh, I know that he or she's not living for the Lord, but I'll just pull them up to my level. No, no, no. Gravity's going to work a lot better than you pulling anybody up. Matter of fact, I don't even know. Maybe I could know a handful. No. I mean, I'm standing here right now. I don't even know an exception to that rule. Every time I've seen a guy or girl date the wrong crowd, they always get pulled down. You never pull them up to where you're at. If the Bible says be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, wouldn't it make sense not to date an unbeliever? Wouldn't it make sense not to date or court a carnal Christian? Because I I consider a a spiritual Christian trying to get serious with a non-spiritual Christian is not an equal yoke. They'll yank you down faster than you can ever yank them up. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Don't kid yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That means evil companionships will destroy moral fiber. Wrong friends pull you down. That's what the Bible says. That's in the middle of the resurrection chapter. As if to say, you want to live a resurrected life? You have good friends. You want to leave the resurrection power of Jesus? Get the wrong friends. And every time, it'll pull you down. There's a telling phrase in 2 Samuel 13, 3. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. He did not have plans to defile his half-sister Tamar. But when he started hanging out with his cousin Jonadab, who was a wicked man, he gravitated to where he was. He ended up raping. He ended up dying for his sin. Where did it start? Well, I could say yes in his evil heart. But when did he begin to activate acting on his sinful fantasies when he brought the wrong friends into his life. Acquire righteous friendships. Do not date, and if your parents use the word courtship, um, we, 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 I thought we were going to have a church split over courtship versus dating. So I got all of the people that were pushing, courting, and dating, and we all talked and we all were on the same page after all. Because we all believed in parental authority over all activities, courtship, dating, and so on. We all believed in uh, abstaining uh, from fornication before marriage. We all agreed to that. Sure. So here's what, here's what I want to say to you. It, don't court or date people that are not right with God. Please don't try to explain to me that, well, I didn't really know. Yes, you do. You don't have to be around somebody for 10 minutes uh, without knowing where their mind is. I love my wife. If I'm sitting next to somebody that I'm talking to on the plane within 10 minutes, I can't help it. She's going to be mentioned. I love her. She's in my mind. She's in my heart. When we walk with God, we can't help it. He's going to be discussed. Number four. Keep thyself pure. How do we do this? Avoid placing yourself in the atmosphere of temptation. When I was teaching at Hiles Anderson, I had 300 preacher boys in my classes, and I really enjoyed it. We had a good time. And I was very young for a professor to be doing what I was doing, and I guess because I was near the same age of many of my students, they felt freedom to talk to me. And I often would have young men come into my office and say, Brother Pope, I've got a problem. I said, what's that? It's lust. And here's what they would say. They would always follow up by saying, I don't know how many times I've claimed 1 Corinthians 10.13. By the way, 1 Corinthians 10.13 is a great verse to memorize. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above the or able, but we will the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. It's a great verse. 
And they would say to me, Brother Pope, I don't know how many times I've laid my hands on that verse. I've named it and claimed it. I've blabbed it and grabbed it. But it doesn't work. I want to say this parenthetically. God's word always works. But we don't. I got in that secret place and I began to ask the Lord. I, I said, Lord, I need to help these great young preacher boys. Wonderful young men of God. But I know exactly what they're talking about. How can I be a blessing? I got my concordance. I looked up the word temptation. Now there's other places temptation is used. But I found six different places that temptation is used like this. Matthew 6.13 Lead us not into, everybody say into, temptation. Temptation. Matthew 26, 41, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Mark 14, 38, lest ye enter into temptation. Uh, Luke eleven four, 4, and lead us not into temptation. Luke twenty two forty, 40, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Luke twenty two forty six, 46, pray that ye enter not into temptation. Compare that with 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taken you. Pray that you enter not into temptation. There hath no temptation taken you. But what's the point? It was like a neon light when I began to meditate over those verses. God is at least six times more interested in delivering us, watch this, in delivering us from the presence of temptation than he is in delivering us from the power of temptation. Furthermore, if we're not looking for a way out of the presence of temptation, God is not obligated to deliver us from the power of temptation. If I invite temptation into my life, then ask God to help me, I've waited too late. That's called presumptuous sinning. To understand what that is, look at the etymology. Presume. Presumptuous sinning. David pray, keep me back from the presumptuous sin. That is doing something on purpose that is wrong. God says, that leads to the great transgression. Deliver me from presumptuous sin, from the great transgression. That's presuming you can get away with what God's judged other of others for. Presuming you have more strength and natural ability to overcome things that nobody else has been able to overcome. Presumptuous sin. If I'm in an airplane and I jump out at 15,000 feet without a parachute... It is presumptuous for me to pray, Oh God, let something open up. No, 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 no. The problem was me. It wasn't the pilot's fault. It was my fault. I jumped out of the plane without a parachute. I'm in the boat in the middle of a huge lake. Say I'm way out in Lake Pontchartrain. And I got a 44 Magnum. I decided to do target practice in the bottom of the boat. I put six holes in the bottom of the boat. Six little geysers are shooting up in the air. Then I pray, oh God, don't let me sink. It is presumptuous for me to say, oh God, don't let me sink when I just blew the bottom of my boat out. It is even more presumptuous to go over to the girl's house and mom and dad are up and you're watching Jeopardy eating popcorn. Then mom and dad go to bed and then you watch the late, late whatever and you get closer and you hold hands. Then you put your arm around her. Then you kiss her and then you kiss her again and you find that you were aroused sexually and then you pray, oh God, don't let me fornicate. Yeah. You idiot. When mom and dad went to bed, you should have gotten your carcass out the door. You don't invite sinful opportunity in your life and then pray God help you after you invited it into your life. By the way, that principle is all through the scripture. Proverbs 4, 14, 15 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. Verse number 8, chapter 5. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. Don't go near the woman's house that you have no business going to. That's what he's saying. Oh, yes. He says in verse number 8, chapter 7, passing through the street near her corner, talking about the wrong kind of woman. He says he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. He stayed out late at night. And behold, there in that place, in the dark night, where he shouldn't have been, met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. And by the way, God said she was dressed like a harlot. Oh. <gasps> 
Uh-huh. Well, Brother Pope, what does it matter? It matters a lot. The Bible says, Jesus said, if a man even looks on a woman, he lusts after her, he's committed adultery with her already in her heart. Women adorn yourselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Modest apparel, the word apparel, katastole, which means long let down covering robes. Cover. Do not extenuate. That's why we have these weird, according to the world, dress codes. Because we want our kids to have a good time on youth activity and not let the kids' minds be where they shouldn't be. And by the way, I'm for guys being modest too. Button up your shirt, pull up your pants, all right? Hey, be modest. You don't go around dressing like harlots or like whoremongers and then wonder, what's the problem? You want to keep yourself pure? Then don't place yourself in the atmosphere of temptation. You don't go to where you shouldn't go. You don't be with who you shouldn't be. You don't dress the way you should not dress. You don't act the way you should not act. And then ask God to help you. No, 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 no. If you're doing what God wants you to do, like Joseph. Chapter 39. Genesis. Mrs. Potiphar, this wicked woman. The Madonna of the day. The Lady Gaga of the day. Didn't even beat around the bush. Yeah. This Miley Cyprus, um, um, the Cyrus uh, type woman yeah. says, which we should not look at at all, all that, or listen to, st yeah. away, stay away. Right. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. Um, so, here's the deal. She reaches out and says, lie with me. She doesn't even beat around the bush. Well, what does Joseph do? My, Mrs. Potiphar, but I see that you're acting very unspiritual. I would like to sit here and share with you the principles that God has shared with me that made me pure. This is not Bible study time. This is running time. Joseph did not even trust himself. He ran from that woman. Now, she framed him. But when it was all said and done, whenever he rode around the chariot a couple years later, she was going like this with her husband whenever he rode by. Oh, listen, God took care of him. And God will take care of you if we do what he... See, do what he tells us to do. Abstain from all appearance of evil. How can I keep myself pure? Adjudge the end results. I, may, I read you some of Proverbs 5 just a moment ago. It says in verse number 11, And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. The Bible plainly points out, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be sure your sin will find you out. You're not going to get away with it. Look at where you end up. Don't go there. Moses forsook the pleasures of sin. How long did it last? For a season. It seemed in the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. And the best day with, listen, the worst day with God is better than the best day with the devil. When we walk in his footsteps, it sleeps good at night, it eats good in the daytime, it gives you joy unspeakable, full of glory. But judge the end results. You know, there's one other thing I like to throw in here that I think would help everybody. Want to keep yourself pure? Live in the climate of Calvary. Live in the climate of Calvary. When I look at Calvary, how can I sin so willingly against my Lord when my sin put him on that cross, crucified him? How can I, how can I entertain that which took my Lord's life? Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Then he said, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Young people, Philippians 2 had it right. We have power, resurrection power, if we live not only in the acknowledgement of his resurrection, but in the fellowship, kononia, the continual reminding of ourselves what our sin cost him, the continual reminding how loved we are by Jesus. You know, I, I want to say this. It, it, it may not ring a bell to a lot of you. 
I've known men that were called great preachers, preachers that have fallen. I've known people that were called great teachers that have fallen. I have known people that were called great singers that have fallen. I've known people that were called um, very smart people that have fallen. I've known people that were even faithful to the church that have fallen. Watch this. But I've never known a person of prayer that ever fell. And when I see prayer, I don't mean those that just talk about it. I mean those that intimately live in the fellowship of the Holy God. Because here's the thing, kids. You can't live in the presence of a Holy God and live an unholy life. And the first thing I do is I go into prayer as I consider Calvary. And I've lived in that climate of Calvary. That's where the fruit of the Spirit will grow. If you're not... Huh? I've been to Israel and I've seen where they grow bananas. We were up in Canada this year earlier saw not one banana tree. Because bananas don't grow in Canada. Are you listening? And thick, tall corn don't grow in Miami. I know that was incorrect English, but I want you to get the point. And neither will holy life grow outside of the climate of Calvary. We've got to have climate of Calvary to really be able to resist temptation. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my greatest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. How can I live in the climate? How, how, can, I, how can I keep myself pure? Last of all, avow yourself pure. Make a vow to God. Ecclesiastes 5 says it is better to have never made a vow than to make a vow and break it. You know, I really appreciate your listening to me today. I don't consider the way I preached this afternoon uh, very dynamic. I understand that. I appreciate that. I, I feel like I'm in friendly, a friendly atmosphere and you've allowed me to just share with you my heart. I'm going to share a little bit more of my heart with you. You have every right to say, okay, Johnny Pope, you're telling me to keep myself pure before I get married. I would like to know what you and your wife did before you got married. When I met my wife, Barbara, I was impressed that she was a lady. She said, what does she think about you? It would take her a month before she would ever discover I was even in America. But I saw her. Our first date was to the rescue mission in Chicago. She played the piano. I led the singing. You might say we started out by making beautiful music together. We were in a 66-passenger bus. And we were coming home, probably uh, with the car you, you and your uh, wife would date like that a little bit. 66 passenger bus, light on. Barbara lived off campus at 820 North Glenwood Avenue there in Griffith, Indiana. And I was in Cherville in Baptist City. And uh, so my friend driving the bus let Barbara off and I was walking her to the door and he pulled the bus down away from the door so nobody could see me walk her to the door. Woohoo! Oh yeah. I got to tell you this. Two years earlier, the Lord spoke to my heart. Don't date any girl and under any circumstance do anything that would arouse you or arouse her. I mean, the Lord spoke that to my heart. I walked to the door. I still remember that night. Golden brown hair. A beautiful nose that looked very girly. Not like mine or my brother's. No, that's different. Beautiful brown eyes that look like pieces of caramel floating in saucers of milk. <laughs> Youth Do by Estee Lauder. I could, that was what she was wearing that night. And I remember looking at her lips. Wow. I never knew a guy that had lips like that. <laughs> I, I felt like they were screaming, kiss me. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, Brother Pope, you are a preacher. Yes. And I'm normal, too. <laughs> And so I took a step forward to tell her good night, and she didn't back up. I said, oh, yeah. First base. Before I could get to second base, God began to speak to my heart. Uh, at that time, I would have liked to have heard, you know, fish or mermaids jump up out of the water singing, kiss the girl, you know. <laughs> or, or as... 
<laughs> or as my friend walking his girlfriend around the Dead Sea knew he couldn't get a kiss unless he appeared spiritual, not knowing a roommate was in the tree reading a book because he couldn't find a private place. So he closed his eyes and he said, Father, Father, up above, shall I kiss the one I love? And a roommate said, Sinner, sinner, down below, puck her up and let her go. No, no, no. I, that, that really didn't happen. I think. Okay. <laughs> I didn't hear anything like that, but here's what I did hear, and I'm going to slow it down a little bit so you can hear it too. Johnny, what are you doing? I'm telling uh, Barbara good night, Lord. I'll tell her good night. Well, I like to tell her good night the way they, they, the way an all American guy would tell a girl good night. I just want to give her a little kiss. I mean, just a little kiss. Not going to be weird or anything. Just a little kiss, a little. Peck. You know, Johnny, yes, Lord. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. Can you kiss her for the glory of God? Can I kiss her for the glory of God? You know, Lord, I believe I could. I, I believe for the glory of God, I could not do that. Uh, yeah. Barbara, yes, Johnny. Oh. I said, can I just thank God for the good time that we had tonight? She said, go ahead. And then she closed her eyes. Her eyes were closed. Her lips were shining. You know, you always kiss with your eyes closed. I was curious about this. After we got married, I thought I would try it one time. I think I'll kiss her without my eyes closed. And so I kissed her with my eyes open. She opened her eyes and I said, God! What are you doing? I said, well, I look so good, I thought... Anyway... Um, <laughs> I know I shouldn't have said that. Y'all forgive me. Okay. So I thank the Lord for the good time that we had. Long story short, the first time my lips touched her lips were the wedding altar. You ought to see our wedding pictures. Every, every other picture. By the way, 1 Corinthians 7 1 says, It is good for man not to touch a woman. Can I give you the Greek word for that touch? It's from two Greek words. One is a word which means getting very close and the other one is strike a fire. If you put it together, it means getting so close you start a fire. That's 1 Corinthians 7. And that coincides with the context because later on the chapter says it is better to marry than to what? Burn. Petting for fun is like lighting a candle in a room full of dynamite. I give God praise and thanks that there was nothing vulgar about our dating experience. We've been married 40 years. We made the vow. On a 25th anniversary, somebody said, hey, y'all going to renew your vows? Nothing wrong with that. I, I, I do renewed vows often. I said, hey, Barb, you want to renew the vows? She said, I hadn't broke my first ones. I like that. I hadn't broke my first ones. I'm thankful that that godly woman kept herself pure for me. And our marriage has been pure. There's nobody else involved. It's, it's good. I know that you can give me some people that you know that were supposed to be good Christians that didn't stay married and didn't stay faithful, but we did, and we have, and we're not perfect. But I go back to the strength that Jesus gave us before we got married that maintained after we were married and made touching so much more sacred because we didn't do the stuff married people did until we got married. This afternoon, I'm going to ask every one of you that are not married to come forward. I'm going to ask the pastors, representing pastors, representing assistant pastors, if the pastor's not here, or if both of you can come, or the youth pastor, or if none of them are here, the, the chaperone if need be, to come stand up here with me. Come on up here. To stand right up here with me. And I'm going to ask Everett, yeah, just go ahead and get up out of your seat if you would, uh, pastors, youth pastors, and uh, stand up here with me. And I'm going to ask you young people to come up here and come up to one of these men up here and simply do this. Say, I promise. Everybody, let's do a trial run. Everybody say, I promise. That's what I want you to do. But I'm not telling it to him. I'm saying, I promise for him to hear me. Okay? But it's to God. Is it not okay 
to make a promise when you get married. I promise to love you. Sickness and in health and poverty is in wealth, forsaking all others and cleaving to thee and to thee only until death parts me. Is that not good to do? Yes. Why wouldn't it be good to go ahead and make a vow to God? I promise, Lord, to keep myself pure until I get married. If you're sitting here saying, well, I, I've, already, I've already messed up. 1 John 1, 9, still in the book. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So go ahead and ask God to forgive you. And here's what, here's what even Dr. Stephen Dirks doesn't realize. God can reprogram you. God can reprogram you. So if you have done things that married people only should do, then, then ask God to give you the strength, make the vow from this point onward, from August the 15th onward, you will continue to keep yourself pure until you get married. And if you have not done anything that married people do, then keep yourself pure until you do. God will bless you. God will reward you. And not only that, but you're going to stay clean and pure so that when he has more information in thy light, you will see light. If you listen to him, he will give you further instruction. It's all part and parcel of finding the perfect will of God in your life. Finding that perfect guy for you. Finding that perfect girl for you. Finding the vocation God has for you. The preaching stuff that God has for you. Or, or whatever stuff that God has for you. Everybody stand up for just a moment. Let's do a trial run. Let me, now this isn't the real thing, but let me hear you say it. Everyone together, I promise. Ready? I promise. Let's try that again. One more time. Ready? Now the next time you say that, I want you to say this to one of the men, but you're saying it to them, or who are you saying it? To them or to who? To God Almighty. You're saying it to the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise, Heavenly Father, thank God for all of the young people.